Mysteries are one of the most exciting and intriguing aspects of any story. They make us want to read more and investigate just exactly what is going on. Mystery is something I want to talk about more in the future, but for now let's focus on one aspect, the mystery box. The mystery box is a narrative technique that involves introducing mysterious elements or plot points to a story, which are gradually revealed over time, building suspense and anticipation in the audience. Simply, imagine I place a box in front of you. Most people's instinct is to open that box and find out what's inside. You are essentially withholding information from your reader, in some form or another, and drip feeding it to them over the course of a story. It's a simple trick to capture the attention of your audience, and it's remarkably flexible, as the mystery can be anything from a hidden object, a character's identity, or a secret place or event. But it is just that. It's a trick. A shadow on the wall. The mystery box can be, and has been, used incredibly effectively throughout literature and television, but it's a double-edged sword, one that must be handled with extreme care. Fail to do so, and the consequences may be severe. Let's start by talking about why this technique is so useful, and why so many writers and filmmakers make use of it. It has very much been popularised by the filmmaker J.J. Abrams since his 2008 speech on the very same thing. The thing is that, that it represents infinite possibility. It represents hope. It represents potential. And what I love about this box, and what I realised I sort of do in, in whatever it is that I do, is I, I find myself drawn to infinite possibility and that sense of potential. And I realise that mystery is the catalyst for imagination. Now, it's not the most groundbreaking idea, but when I started to think that maybe there are times when mystery is more important than knowledge, I started getting interested in this. Ultimately, any time you're introducing an idea of mystery into your story, but specifically the mystery box technique, you are doing so to create an air of intrigue and curiosity for the reader. You want to draw them into the story, make them invested in discovering all of the answers. You want them to open the box. In Agatha Christie's Murder on the Orient Express, the mystery of who killed Ratchet keeps most readers engaged in the story, especially it is the core focus of the story. We get adequate amounts of tension as we read, as we know the book will end with the revelation of said culprit and everything we're reading is building towards that point. All of this builds suspense and makes us wonder what is going to happen next. Edgar Allan Poe was a genius with this use of the mystery box, and the cask of Amontillado is one of the best examples of hooking the reader into a tense and suspenseful mystery. We want to know what Montress's plan is to get revenge on Fortunato. Another great use of the mystery box is as the inciting incident for our story to unfold. We've discussed why having that call to adventure is so important to our characters, and having a mysterious one provides a great premise for the story to evolve. The murder of the Louvre's curator in Dan Brown's The Da Vinci Code gives us the entire foundation of the story to unfold. On a similar note, and as we've talked about before, having a suitable mystery allows for subversion of expectations, as done well in Gillian Flynn's Gone Girl, where the assumptions we make as a reader go a long way to allowing the twists and turns of that story to reveal themselves in relatively satisfying ways. Let's take a moment to look at all the examples I've given. Did you notice something that they all have in common? Essentially, these mystery boxes work effectively for two key reasons. First of all, and you'd think obviously, but that's rarely the case with lazy writers, all these mystery boxes have solutions. We know who killed Ratchet in the end. We know what Montress's plan is and why the curator was killed. In Gone Girl, all those assumptions are actually an essential part of the reading experience, and the mystery is woven so well into the narrative. If you're going to have a mystery box in your story, you have to know what's inside. This is where J.J. Abrams often gets criticised. He's actually quite good at setting up intriguing mysteries like the island in Lost or Rey's parentage in Star Wars, but it's quite evident by the end of those stories that he himself didn't know what the answers were when he started introducing those mysteries to the story. It's fine if you don't want to reveal all the mysteries to your reader. Some great pieces of media have never shown all their cards, if they're not the primary focus of the story but we can be confident that all the writers know exactly what is inside the mystery box, or at least never have the intention of showing them. And that leads us on to our second point. All mystery boxes that we've seen that are successful tend to be the core focus of their stories, 
and have a whole, comprehensive, and importantly consistent web of hints and strings attached. The stories are geared towards the discovery and exposure of these mysteries. The stories care about the mysteries, exploring them subtly, and therefore we as the reader care too. That leads us onto the risky territory. When mystery boxes go wrong, boy do they go wrong. In Arthur Conan Doyle's The Adventure of the Musgrave Ritual, we never really find out the full explanation for the eponymous ritual, which can leave some readers feeling dissatisfied. The story as a whole is gripping and interesting, so having this mystery unanswered doesn't detract from the rest of the narrative too much, but it can leave a bad taste in the mouth of the reader. The point of this is not paying off your mysteries in a satisfying way that feels earned and appropriately foreshadowed can seriously affect your reader's enjoyment. Lost always stands out as the principal offender here. The TV show was so famous for its mysteries that by the end, when it was trying to reveal all of them, the opening of the box left many fans feeling duped or disappointed. The nature of the island had very little setup to the eventual revelation, and the purpose of the Dharma Initiative felt tacked on and lazy. What had started as intriguing mysteries had clearly not been thought through before their introduction, and therefore led to the story not knowing how to pay them off in a satisfying way. Dan Brown's The Da Vinci Code, which we mentioned earlier for having a very solid core mystery box premise, ultimately ended up disappointing fans by increasing the expectations so much over the course of the story that its payoff fell flat and felt decisively underwhelming and anticlimactic. Both Lost and The Da Vinci Code are victims of another major blunder that befalls writers who are trying to make their story more interesting and mysterious, which is the overuse of mystery boxes. Constantly introducing new mysteries and bombarding audiences with yet another plot twist quickly makes the work feel contrived and forced. More than that, most people can't follow along with all the concurrent mysteries and decide to just stop caring altogether. The latest Star Wars trilogy, something J.J. Abrams was heavily involved in, is guilty of this in spades. Oh my god, like mystery boxes are everywhere in what I do. We are given so many questions by the films that are so inconsistently written and never really paid off that many audiences felt confused and disappointed. You actually have to be prepared to give answers to questions that the audience might ask. Take a critical lens to your own work, keep your work tidy. More isn't always better, less is more. In Star Wars we're flooded with so many mysteries that either have no, little or inconsistent results. Who are Ray's parents? They were nobody. They were filthy junk traders. Who sold you off for drinking money? Five minutes later. You're his granddaughter. You are a palpitating. Who was Snoke? A good question. For another time. Where did the First Order come from? A good question. For another time. How did Maz Kanada have Luke's lightsaber? A good question. Who are the Knights of Ren? For another time. On and on and on it goes, without satisfying answers in sight. When writing, you never want to ask more questions than you're prepared to answer, because ultimately, sooner or later, you do actually have to open that mystery box. You can't put off the answers forever, unless of course you don't have the answers, which is something we've already pointed out as being pretty important. I think a useful analogy here is wrapping a present. You can spend as long as you want making the present look lovely with bows and ribbers and hyping up the excitement that's within it, but at the end of the day, if you don't put any effort into what's inside all the wrapping, you're going to get tears at Christmas. The real issue with introducing so many mysteries is that it so often feels like a contrived way to move the plot forward and give the characters artificial or unearned motivation. It's very tempting to chuck in one more mystery to get a character from point A to point B, but you end up doing lots of damage. Not only do the mysteries feel unnecessary and out of place, but your story ends up simply lurching from mystery to mystery just so the writer can get their story where they want it. This reduces the agency of your characters, and relegates them to mere pawns being shuffled around rather than being detailed and interesting people that can be developed in order to continue their journey. Your characters stop being just that they stop being characters within their own story. Mystery has its place in stories. It's so important to trigger the imagination of your reader by allowing them to dream up what the answers could be, but inundating them with so many hurts them too. It's too much of a good thing. Readers like mysteries, but they like satisfying answers more. 
So if you don't give them the answers, because you've got so many loose ends, your story ends up being a convoluted and contrived mess, with no characters, no stakes, enormous amounts of good fortune, and far too many mysteries than you know what to do with. The writer gets so excited with all that potential they're creating with the mysteries, that they don't actually use any of the potential in the end. The story concludes with a million questions, but no answers. So that's all the doom and gloom, but how can we actually write good mystery boxes that are compelling without being contrived? Well, first of all, you should identify what your key mystery is. Define it to yourself at least. You must understand this before you begin to write, so you know exactly what you're aiming for, and how you're going to build towards it. All the hints you're going to lay out, and all the non-contrived plots on the journey that will take your character there. Once you've got your mystery, then you can start by introducing it. A client can come to see Sherlock Holmes, Amy Dunn goes missing, Sam Spade is hired by Miss Wonderly, or the Night's Watch are killed by the White Walkers. Take some time to establish the mystery. Make sure your characters have the required interest to pursue it, and give just enough detail to make your reader want to find out more. Now you're underway, you want to be fleshing out more detail around the mystery and dropping some hints. In Gone Girl, Amy's journal provides us with clues about her state of mind and the events leading up to her disappearance. You want to make sure you're giving enough information to keep your reader interested, but not so much that they don't need to keep reading to discover the answer. Importantly here, make sure your clues are consistent with the actual answer to the mystery. If you think the solution is too obvious, then you can go back and revise the solution, but be warned. This can damage everything you've written so far, and you may need to make further revisions, so make sure that you're editing carefully. Once you've started introducing your mystery, you can start adding some red herrings, or false clues, to misdirect your audience. This can add some tension and suspense and help us root for the protagonist even further as well as providing some breathing room and space for character growth. The Maltese Falcon by Dashiell Hammett is flush with red herrings that keeps the readers engrossed in the story. But again, do this with moderation. Too many red herrings and your reader will feel like they're being manipulated. Finally, and obviously, you should resolve the central mystery. Leaving one or two threads open-ended can give you room for sequels, but for a first novel, it's best not to get too far ahead of yourself and just focus on one story at a time. The cliffhanger ending can be great for setting up later events, but the best mystery boxes are the ones that are opened fully and shown to make complete, logical and narrative sense with everything that led up to them. Murder on the Orient Express is a textbook example of logical deductions from the characters, a surprise reveal, and a resolution that ties up all the clues and suspects neatly at the end. So, the next time you're thinking about introducing a mystery into your story, just take care to avoid throwing them in randomly just to make it more mysterious or more convenient for you as a writer. Make sure you plan your mysteries in advance and keep them consistent with everything else you've planned. After all, fail to do so. And the consequences may be severe.